Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good morning, if you're zooming in from the, across the pond. My name's Ivor. I'm a recovered alcoholic. And I'd like to thank you, Young, for uh, hosting today and for inviting me to come and share a little of my experience, strength, and hope. I'd like to thank Gareth for uh, reading the preamble and Rachel for the traditions and James for doing the reading, which is on page 8 um, of uh, As Bill Sees It. And a warm welcome to each and every one of you here today. I know a few faces in the room. Uh, pleased to see my fellow Glaswegian Fraser. I've not seen him for a while. Um, but uh, to all my new friends, welcome. And especially if you're new, I noticed that there were one or two who were indicating that they were early in their journey. You know, please stick around. And, and certainly do not judge Alcoholics Anonymous and what you're about to hear from this crazy Scotsman. I'm just an ex-drunk who has found a way to live that new life that's promised in this reading through the 12-step program of Alcoholics Anonymous, through a dependence upon a power greater than myself that I still do not understand, but it absolutely exists for me. Um... And, you know, today I want to start off with a few moments of gratitude because I ha- thanks to Alcoholics Anonymous, I have a new life. If I had got the life that I deserved by my actions, my life would have ended at the age of 24 with a little byline in the local Glasgow newspaper, 24-year-old man found dead in flat fire, no suspicious circumstances. That was the way my drinking took me. I was so intoxicated uh, one night in Govan Hill in the south side of Glasgow that I could easily have died were it not for the intervention of a power greater than me that had my then girlfriend come 10 minutes early than she normally would have to find me in a flat full of smoke and uh, and save me, basically. Um, so I have been given a 37 and a half year extension to my life because my sobriety date, that makes me very, very old, but it makes me very grateful as well. You know, um, I've had this wonderful extension to my life. But, you know, for a long, long time, I thought that my problem was drinking, per se, and that the solution was just not to drink. And it's one of the reasons why I picked this reading, because I'm going to share my experience, strength and hope for the next just under half an hour um, around the reading. Um, and uh, anybody that's in the room that is new, you know, look for the similarities, please, not the differences. And uh, as I said, do, don't judge Alcoholics Anonymous on me. Get to plenty of meetings. Um, so my sobriety date, I've told you, my home group is Towards Emotional Sobriety. You'll see the details in, the, in my name uh, on Zoom. I've also put my contact details up there. Um, if anybody wants to follow up, um, as a recovered alcoholic, I cannot not help another alcoholic now who wants help through this 12-step program. That is the full benefit of the spiritual awakening that I've had resulted from the psychic change from the 12-step program of recovery. Um, and it's become the greatest privilege and pleasure of my life to be able to do that one day at a time. My uh, my home group is Towards the Muslim Sobriety, and it's on at 3 o'clock today, UK time. And uh, anybody that's thinking of coming, I have to warn you that whereas we normally have really good speakers, today is me. God's plan for me today, yes, is to do two shares back to back. So I warn you in advance uh, that you'll get me again at, uh, at 3 o'clock today. Um so as to the reading, is sobriety all that we are to expect of a spiritual awakening? Well, let me tell you, uh, between the ages of 16 and 25, the only spiritual awakening I got was when I took a drink out of a can or a bottle. You know, that was my spiritual awakening. Um, I had no clue for many years after I stopped drinking what a spiritual awakening was. All I knew was that in July 1984, two months after that flat incident that I described to you, um, I knew that I had a problem with my drink. I didn't understand why, but I knew that whenever I took a sip of alcohol, I, all bets were off. I could not stop. I could not stay stopped. Page 8, Nicky. Um, could not stay stopped at all. Um, but I didn't understand alcoholism. I understand today, and for the benefit of any newcomers that are in the room, as an alcoholic, when I put alcohol into my system, it activates an allergy, an allergic reaction, an abnormal reaction that manifests itself in a compulsion over which I've got no control. And although I describe myself as a recovered alcoholic because I am, I ain't cured. 
if I was to forget, if I was to develop some debilitating mental disease like uh, Alzheimer's over the coming years and forget that I cannot drink, I know for certainty that if I was to put alcohol into my body, it would activate that compulsion. I would be off again. You know, the second part of this illness, though, is that you see, um, no matter how many times drinking became a problem for me in my late teens and early twenties, my head would tell me next time will be different. Next time you'll be able to manage and control your drink. Just stay on beer. Don't drink spirits. Don't go to that pub. Don't drink with him, and certainly don't drink with her. You know, I come up with all the rationalisations and justifications that are described in masterly detail in our big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I didn't understand any of that. When I had to stop drinking in July 1984, after I'd nearly killed myself for the second time in two months through sheer intoxication, I knew that I cannot drink. And I knew that the only way that I could do that possibly was to do it one day at a time. Where did I get that idea from? It certainly didn't come from my brain. I got that from a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous who had, as we say, 12-step me as a young man aged 20, 21. His name was Matt Headley, and he used to tell me, he used to sit down and talk to me every single Friday when I visited his place of work. And I, I thought he was a crazy old man. You know, and he, and he told me a bunch of stuff about being a member of Alcoholics Anonymous and fellowships and programs and meetings and higher powers. And I just edited it all down and recalled it a few years later when I needed to stop drinking myself because the bit that I could do was to not drink one day at a time. And that was all that I did. I had just successfully, well, a manner of speaking, completed 60 days um, not drinking one day at a time before my last blowout. But in the course of those 60 days as a 25-year-old man, my head told me, mm, Ivor, you can't possibly be alcoholic. If you were alcoholic, you wouldn't be able to stay off it for 60 days. You know, anyway, you can't be an alcoholic because you're only 25. You know, uh, all that stuff. And so eventually I picked up the first drink, which then led to my spectacular blowout in uh, Crete in July 1984. But I didn't understand alcoholism. But I did manage to stay away from one drink for one day at a time. But, you know, see if that was sufficient for me to have recovered from alcoholism and to have lived a happy and contented 37 and a half years, you would have a different speaker here today. It's my experience that although there was a period immediately after I physically recovered from my last bender where life was good and I threw myself into work and I, I was promoted several times in the first year and the following year my girlfriend who had found me in the flat in May and uh, we got married and, um, you know, things were good. You know, Bill Wilson talked about the goose hung high in his story uh, in the big book, and that was certainly my experience for a few months. And then something happened that had happened to me before I started drinking in the first place. My head, oh man, my head. From the moment I woke up in the morning to the moment I went to bed at night, my head was racing off at 100 miles an hour. As soon as I woke up in the morning, my first thought was, oh no, and my head would race off projecting into the day with all these fears about what you thought about me and what was going to happen and all these things that I had to do. I was a perfectionist. I was an egomaniac with an inferiority complex. I didn't know these terms then, but that was me. My stomach was churning all day long and I had no idea what was going on. I first came to Alcoholics Anonymous three years and three months exactly after my last drunk. I didn't know what else to do. There was a wee man who worked with me called Archie G, and I was later on to discover that Archie G was the Glasgow's equivalent of Clancy Emerson. Members in the room who have been around for a while will know who I'm talking about, Clancy from Los Angeles. And, I, and this man um, just worked in me every single day. And he would ask me these horrendous questions. How are you today, big man? I had no idea how to answer that. The best answer I could give was fine. Later in Alcoholics Anonymous, I was to discover that fine is an acronym, and the polite version is fearful, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. You can guess what the other F word is, right? That was how I felt day in, day out. And he would say things to me which baffled and bewildered me. He would say, son, alcohol comes in cans and bottles, but alcoholism comes in people. And I had no idea what he was talking about. And I used to argue with him. And at three years dry, I would say, but actually, how can how I'm feeling have anything to do with alcohol? So I've not had a drink of alcohol for over three years. And he would just say, go to your meeting, go, go to your meeting, sir. And eventually in October 1987, a few days before the, my first child was born, um, I didn't know what else to do. I was beaten and 
broken mentally, emotionally, and even though I didn't understand the term spiritually, I was also broken physically, but that's another story. Um, and I went to my first proper meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, Albert Drive on a Wednesday night, and uh, I got a lovely welcome. The people in the room were not at all like alcoholics, as I imagined them. I'm still looking for the guy with the beard that's been growing for 20 years, who wears a coat with two pieces of string. I've never yet met him in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and yet he was my preconceived idea of what an alcoholic was. There were lovely people in the room. The top table was two middle-aged women that night called Elsie and Helen A. My head's telling me, oh, you're not going to get anything out of them either. But then I remembered Archie's sage advice was to look for the similarities, not the differences, and listen. And I got identification, and I got hope. And the biggest hope that I got that very first night was there was a big picture frame up behind the speaker which said, you are no longer alone. And I liked that. At the age of 28, by this time, I felt so alone for so long. I could remember my mother, long before I drank, hands and hips, apron in hand, looking at me, shaking her head and saying, I don't know where I got you. I was such an oddball. I was such a weirdo. Drink made me feel normal. Drink enabled me to fit in. Drink enabled me to talk to my fellow human beings. And most importantly of all, as, a, as an adolescent with hormones, it enables me to talk to girls. I needed drink to feel anything. And at 28 years old, I got hope. At my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Still didn't know anything about a spiritual awakening, though. But I heard, the, I heard the term getting used. And, and, of course, we finish off the meetings in Glasgow mostly with a serenity prayer. And the word God made me bristle. And I kept hearing it's a, it's a spiritual program. We're a spiritual fellowship. We're not religious. But, you know, the, the, the repeated use of the word God and prayer and stuff made me sceptical. But I just kept coming because there was something in the rooms. There was something in the people that I wanted so for me, sobriety, actual physical sobriety, was just a bare beginning. But for a long, long time, that was all I had. My story is that for a long, long time as a member, as an attender of Alcoholics Anonymous between 1987 and 1995, um, all I did was come to meetings. I would occasionally share. I would occasionally go out on 12-step calls with older members. I was only going to one, two, maybe three meetings a week. Didn't understand that the 12-step recovery program is a design for living sober. It's a, a plan to recover fully, physically, mentally, spiritually from the illness of alcoholism. I didn't understand that the main problem of the alcoholic centers in the mind. I didn't understand that although I was uh, doing quite well materially, um, being physically absent from alcohol, in here, I was not recovering. In fact, I was sliding back the way and I didn't see it as insidious. After eight years of uh, being a member of Alcoholics Anonymous and doing some of the things that were suggested, I kept asking people to be my sponsor because, only because everybody else seemed to have one and I felt kind of left out. And the reality is that, you know, I, could, I couldn't let anybody in. I remember asking this lovely wee man called George Dunipis from Renfield St. Stephen's Friday morning meeting to be my sponsor. And within 30 seconds, I've sacked him. I can't let anybody in. I can't let anybody in to know the real me. Because if you knew the real me, you would not want to know me. You would want to have nothing to do with me. The reality, looking back, is that see if our founder, Bill Wilson, had happened to still be alive and had happened to be in Glasgow in the late 1980s, I would have sacked him as well. I could not let anybody in. I had a big book, and I read it, and I thought it was a fascinating book with lots of quaint language. Again, I didn't get, because I'm not getting taken through it by a sponsor, I didn't get that it was this design for living, this recovery plan. So I never recovered. I didn't address my illness of alcoholism in the centers of my mind. And my experience is that after eight years of being a member of the fellowship and around about 11 years sober, I, um, I stopped coming to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous completely. Um, I didn't get that, like it says in the reading, the sobriety is only the first gift of the first awakening. My first awakening was when I stopped drinking. You know, my second awakening was when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, but I didn't progress beyond that. The reason that I stopped coming to meetings was because I, uh, I had a new obsession. I was in an intolerable work situation, and my plan, my solution to that intolerable situation was to become a self-employed businessman and escape the clutches of Strathclyde Regional Council Social Work Department, 
nothing against social work or Strand Foundation Council, but the place that I worked, it was awful at the time, and I couldn't handle it. I had no acceptance. I had no, I had no spiritual program for dealing with life and life's terms. And I threw myself into a business, reacquainted myself with my friend, the Incredible Hulk, who you can see over my shoulder here, and I became a, a comic book retailer. And I was going to show the Americans how to retail American comic books. And it was it was so exciting, so intoxicating. I threw myself into this business venture. You know, I didn't know, I didn't see the bit in the book about uh, how um, spiritual progress, you know, should come first. The material progress always comes after spiritual progress. I, I just threw myself at this work work idea, and for a while it was exciting, it was seductive, it was addictive. And suddenly I've got no time to go to meetings. I've got no roots, you see. I haven't. I, I'm no longer in a group. I don't have a sponsor. And um, and I went a week without a meeting, and I thought oh, I'll go back to Langside Halls Thursday night next week, or I'll go back to Albert Drive next week. A week went by, a month went by, three months went by, and in my experience is the longer you're away from meetings, alcohol is anonymous, whether actual or online, the harder it is to come back. And that's my experience. Dry. My, I take my hat off to people who come back after the drank, you know. That's not my experience, but I take my hat off to you because for me it was so hard to come back. I eventually came back to Alcoholics Anonymous in 2003. I'm eight years and two months away from Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, I am beaten. I am broke. Everything that I didn't understand previously about the illness of alcoholism became my experience in those eight years and two months. So much so that when I came back, and I, uh, I thought, is, is what I'm suffering from untreated alcoholism? Is it possible that Alcoholics Anonymous has got a solution for how I'm feeling? Because I began to think that, you know, I must have some other mental condition, that I must, I must need to find some psychiatrist or some psychologist who would sit down and diagnose me and give me a course of treatment uh, and medication, and he would go away and write up an article for the medical journal of the Lancet and become famous, and I would be cured. But I, I, by this time, I dusted down my big book, and I began to read it with earnest. I began to read it, understanding that it might, just might, offer a solution. Why was that? Because the very first night I came back to Albert Drive, we John Q handed me the laminate sheet for the reading, How It Works, from Chapter 5. And I read this out, and the first line says, Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. And right there and then, I realised I had not thoroughly followed his path. But I got hope because I thought, well, even at 19 years and two months away from booze, maybe just maybe if I do what he suggests, maybe I'll I'll get what I, I want, what I saw in everybody that was coming into the room. So in some cases, we're just weeks or months sober. And I'm thinking that you're thinking that I should have all this sussed. I should, I should, I should have all this crack, you know. But was it, was it just alcoholism? Not minimising alcoholism. Alcoholism is a killer disease, but was it just alcoholism and not some other mental health condition that I was suffering from? Well, on page 52 of the big book, there's a paragraph called The Bedevilments, and this absolutely nailed me and had nailed me for several years. We were having trouble with personal relationships. In fact, I'm going to personalise it. I couldn't control my emotional nature. I was a prey to misery and depression. I couldn't make a living. I had a feeling of uselessness. I was full of fear. I was unhappy. I couldn't seem to be real help to other people. That was me over 19 years sober, in inverted commas. And I decided I'm going to give this AA a try. It's got to be better than anything I've tried because, honestly, my life it just was like a car crash. Everything that I held dear, including that business idea, had crashed down around my ears. My beautiful wife, the mother to my now three grown-up children, had told me in 1997 that she couldn't stand living with me anymore. She didn't use these terms, but later on I was to identify myself as an extreme example of self will run riot, though I certainly didn't think so. Um, that was me. I went 15 years without more than a long weekend off, and I'm not exaggerating, I could not stop working. And what I used to think was a badge of honour, that I was following in the footsteps of the great entrepreneurial figures that I admired, just became an albatross around my neck. I was absolutely beaten. But in 2003, when I came back to Alcoholics Anonymous, I began to discard my old life. I decided by the time I got to step three of our book, after a few months, I've uh, discarded my old idea about God, and I realised that what, what Bill is telling us in the chapter of Agnostics, that all I have to do is be willing to believe in a power greater than either. And I had to. 
I had to believe that there was a power greater than I ever. I had to believe that there was a power that I could tap into. Because I'd made such a mess of my life. I had no friends. The business venture that I'd thrown myself into was now almost £200,000 in debt. I'd, I was credit cards out to the max. I had personal and secured loans and business loans and overdrafts. And all I was doing was working. I was absolutely desperate. I, I, I said I was sick of crap sobriety. So I began to discard my old life and I began to throw myself into Alcoholics Anonymous. Since 2003 to this day in my journey, I've never not been in a group. I was in a group in the Cooper Institute in Cathcart on the south side of Glasgow for 14 years. I'm now in a virtual group, as I said earlier, towards Immortal Sobriety. I've never not had a sponsor. This time I decided to try living life A's way and amazingly it began to work. That's what I'm here to tell you, the people especially who are new in the room. Alcoholics Anonymous works. It's much, much more than just going to meetings, whether they're actual or virtual. A, Alcoholics Anonymous and the big book is a design for living. Because the reading says the one that did not work, my life did not work. It was a disaster area. And I began to seek and apply and live in a new life that can and does work under any conditions, whatever. I didn't sponsor MD through this 12-step program until I was 24 years sober. Memo to everybody who's in the room who's less than 24 years sober, you do not need to wait. I mean, if you think about it, if you look at her history, uh, a man called Ebby Thatcher carried this message to her founder, Bill Wilson, at two months sober. Bill then carried the message to her other co-founder, Dr. Bob, at five months sober. The two of them, at weeks and months sober, then carried the message to AA number three, the man in the bed, I just days and weeks sober, Bill D. And so it began slowly but surely. It's just my journey. This was the journey that I had to take. But I'll tell you that since 24 years sober to the point where I am today, helping another alcoholic, trying to carry this message to alcoholics and trying to practice these principles in all my affairs has given me a life beyond my wildest dreams. And I want to spend a few minutes before closing just looking at the, the last paragraph of the reading which I'll just reiterate, I know there's a couple of people who came in late. And the, the second paragraph says, regardless of worldly success or failure, regardless of pain or joy, regardless of sickness or health, or even of death itself, a new life of endless possibilities can be lived if we are willing to continue our awakening through the practice of these 12 steps. You know, at some point after I made the decision in step three to turn my will and my life over to the care of a God that I cannot see, smell, hear, or touch, um, something began to happen. I began to lose my fear of today, tomorrow, or the hereafter. I began to find that anger was no longer a big thing for me. But here's what I used to be like, just to give you a wee snapshot of what I used to be like as I start raving sober, Ivor. I was about 18 years away from drink. I've got a very strained relationship with my three then teenage children. And I only get to see them one night a week. And one night they came over to my flat on the south side of Glasgow and we were going to have a nice night watching one of these newfangled DVDs. And I, I was going to get them a takeaway curry. And, um, and I, I'm, I'm getting quite stressed at the simple act of, of separating out the curry, putting out the curry on the plates with all the rice and the chapatis and whatever. And I asked my eldest daughter to come and help me. And she said, just a minute, Dad. She was, she was preoccupied with her brand new mobile phone. That wasn't good enough for me. I said, no, I need your help now, darling. Still, she said, just a minute, Dad. That wasn't good enough for me. I strode out into the living room and I tried to grab the phone off her. She pushed back on me. I stepped back and I had a coffee table with a glass under table. And I stepped back onto the glass under table and it cracked. And there was a, and there was a moment where the red mist came down and there was a possibility of me doing anything. Fortunately, I've always had something inbuilt that I would never strike my children, but I had such a rage in me that I needed to release that somehow. So my three kids, 14, 12 and 10, sitting on the couch, looking forward to having a nice night with Dad, suddenly see Dad putting his boot right through the living room door. That's the way I was as a, just a dry alcoholic. And later, when I came back to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and my children knew that I was going to these meetings, they interrogated me. They said, Dad, why did you go back to these meetings? Did you drink? We won't tell Mum. And I said, no, darling, I never drank. But see that either, and I reiterated that story. I don't ever want to be like that again. 
thanks to this program, thanks to the spiritual awakening and the entire psychic change that I have had gradually over a period of years, as described in our Appendix 2 on spiritual experience, although I know my sobriety date off by heart, I can't remember the day that that rage left me. I can't remember the day that that paralyzing fear that used to be my constant companion left me, but I'll tell you they've left me. Now, I'm not saying that I'm a saint. Of course, I still have anger. I still have fear. But I've got tools to deal with it now. They're all in the book. They're all in the program. The point is that I no longer am uh, dictated by these emotions. I've got, I have got. found a way to manage and control my emotions that I never previously had. And that is miraculous for this guy who used to be driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking and self-pity underpinned by resentment, rage and fear. That's how I used to be. Thanks to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, that's not me anymore. You know? And thanks to the program, I now have the best relationship possible with these now three grown-up children. Uh, I could have missed the life that I've got. I'm a grandfather now to a wee boy who's just over two and a half years old. I've got a second grandchild on the way in seven weeks' time. Later on today, my son, age 30, is coming round to my flat to go over his marriage vows and marriage speech because he's getting married on Friday, and I'll be there. And I'm able to be that dad that can listen to him tonight and hopefully help him, you know, uh, through his stress and anxiety with his vows and his, uh, his vows and his speech. I could have missed all that. I could not have done that were it not for Alcoholics Anonymous. And the line about, regardless of sickness or health, um, old age does not come alone. You know, I'm, I, my next birthday, I'll be 63 years old. And uh, a couple of years ago, I woke up one morning and um, I could barely breathe. It was as if my lungs had deflated overnight. And I faced the fear and I contacted my GP and uh, cut a long story short, I ended up in, in hospital that afternoon. And, uh, over the next two days, um, we're getting every every test under the sun free, thanks to our National Health Service. Um, I was diagnosed with uh, severe heart failure, and it was given I was given a number. I was told it was a Category Four, and I remember quipping with a young consultant. I said, "Oh, what's a Category Five? And he said, "It's a wooden box." And I went, "Oh, this was quite serious then." Um, but you know, during the three days that I was in hospital. I felt loved and protected and watched over because, you see, my attitude is quite clearly that I was safe from dying at the age of 25 by the intervention of a power greater than myself that I quite happily call God, though I'm not a religious person. And I've been given an extension to my life. I've been given a reason for my life. You know, I now know that I am alive today, not just to stay sober for myself, but to help other alcoholics. So in those three days, I listened to the doctors and I came out of hospital and I thought, okay, Ivy, you've been given another, yet another wake-up call. And I've taken action over the last two years. I've lost just under three stone in weight and I've exercised regularly. There's all kinds of other things going on. Um, I've got tinnitus in my left ear, which, you know, um, is really, really wearing and I've got other tests going on for some other things. But you know what? I'm in God's hands. I turn my will and my life over to the care of God. And the spiritual equation, which seems to work, and this is amazing for a guy who has not found it necessary to go back to any kind of faith. The spiritual equation which works for me seems to be that the more I look after God's kids, the more God looks after me. That seems to be how this works. And I don't know how much longer I've got in this mortal forum, but I do believe that the more that I practice the principles of the program, the more that I live in steps 10, 11, and 12, Step 11, what a design for living, step 11 alone gives us. From on awakening throughout the day to reviewing our day at the end of the day. You know, the more that I live in 10, 11 and 12, the more that I enjoy life. And that's the, basically that's the promise of the reading and part of the reason why I chose this reading. Um, because I, I, I now know what a spiritual awakening is. I've had one. I'm still living it. Every morning on awakening, I, 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 I look forward to the day. Um, incredible things have been happening in my life over the last year. The last two years, just to say, and hats off to Young and the members of this group for offering this platform, because the last two years 
started off as the biggest threat to alcoholics and animals worldwide since it was founded in America in 1935 and since it landed in the UK in 1947. And yet, amazingly, for me, the last two years have turned out to be the most transformative period in all my journey. And it's thanks to platforms like this Sheffield As Bill Sees It Eat that have been on week after week after week, bringing together alcoholics and potential alcoholics from all over the world to learn and share experience, strength and hope. So it's hats off to the group for doing that. Um, and my own experience is that it's been the most transformative period in all my, in all my time. Um, I've gone from somebody who didn't sponsor MD to now I've got a wee battalion. Of, uh, of sponsees and uh, honest to goodness, you know, spiritual awakening for me, my, my biggest area of spiritual growth is in my step 12 work, you know, to uh, life has taken on new meaning, to see people recover, to see them then going and helping others, to see a, a fellowship grow up about you, to have a host of friends. This is an experience I could have missed. I'm so grateful to Bill Wilson, so grateful to our founder, so grateful to Alcoholics Anonymous, so grateful to all of you today for being here and making this a meeting. And I'll shut up now before Young shuts me up. Very, very glad to be here and be able to be sober. Thank you so much. I look forward to any and all comments in the second half of the meeting. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.